For this session, we will give 10 units from PMA, 5 units from PAFP, and 10 units from PCP. For those who have not registered yet, please email us at upmedwebinars1 at gmail.com so you can, avoid, you can avail the CME units from PMA. For those with PCP and PAFP ID numbers, please also email us. Our email is upmedwebinars1 at gmail.com. We are now using GoToWebinar platform for this webinar. If you are encountering problems as you participate, please log out from the session and rejoin the meeting by using the link sent earlier to your emails. Our webinar ID number is 128-473-0A3. If you cannot rejoin the meeting room, kindly stream the session at livestream.upm.edu.ph and tweet your questions to upmedwebinars hashtag upmweb. You can also text your questions to 0915-905-0918. Okay, first, your mic should be mute for the rest of the meeting. Second, use the chat box mainly for your questions and comments. All your questions on the topic should be addressed to our moderator, Dr. Yela Castillo. If you are experiencing technical problems, I will be the one to assist you. Third, the session will run for an hour, 30 minutes allotted for lecture, followed by a five-minute reaction, then a question and answer portion. Our moderator for today is a member of the UPCM Class 1990, pediatrician, child protection advocate, and 2006 OYM award. Without further ado, let's welcome our, our moderator, Dr. Castillo. Thank you, Cherise. Our time now in Manila is 12.01 p.m. and I am speaking from the video conferencing room of the UP Manila, Padre Faura Street, Ermita, Manila. Welcome to all our participants. How many do we have logged in? We have 17 logged in to go to webinar and we have 27 from the NKTI conference room. Uh, and how many more through streaming. Today's topic is about measuring quality in healthcare. And the objectives of uh, the webinar today is to go over some of the ways quality in healthcare has been defined and measured, to highlight current problems with the way quality is measured and to decompose quality into core elements and discuss the challenges in measuring these elements. We'd like to thank our sponsor for today's webinar, the National Kidney and Transplant Institute, Asia's leading kidney and transplant center. For today, our speaker is Dr. Leo Selly. He is my classmate. He is a graduate of the UP College of Medicine, class 1990, where he also garnered academic excellence in medicine. He trained at Cleveland Clinic and had his fellowships at the combined Harvard Infectious Disease Program, Stanford University Medical Center, and Massachusetts General Hospital. He also became an instructor in Stanford University School of Medicine, University of Otago, Dunedin School of Medicine, and in Harvard Medical School, where he serves as an instructor up to the present. Aside from his academic and hospital appointments, committee service, and other professional positions, Leo has also several honors and prizes under his belt. Some of them are the M Health Alliance Award for SANA, third place for Wireless Innovation Prize for SANA, Information Technology Award, and the Philippine Science High School Gawad Lagablab Award, the Most Outstanding Alumni for Medicine. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Leo Selly. Not yet, Yella. Good. Hello. You're not yet ready. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> because you were whispering, can I take off? Can I turn off my camera? 
Ah, ang galing ng ano mo. Pwede kang bumake. Ang galing ng pick-up mo. <laughs> Mamaya. Yeah, I have to use Otago in a sentence first. <laughs> <laughs> Mamaya. <laughs> okay. So, uh, let's uh, move on to the talk. Uh, the title of which is Measuring Quality in Healthcare. Uh, it's 12 midnight here, so kung makatulog ako, uh, pasensya na. But I'm going to start off with a personal story that uh, motivated me to be interested in quality. And this happened in 2002. Uh, it was July 31st, and I sustained a mountain biking injury uh, with a right lower leg fracture. So I was admitted on a Wednesday, and this was in July. So for those who, uh, who don't know, July is the uh, month where you have new interns starting. Um, my surgery was scheduled uh, the following Friday, and it was supposed to be the first case. And my orthopedic surgeon assured me that it was a straightforward case. Uh, at that time, I was running marathons, and he said that I'd be training in no time. So uh, Friday came, that was uh, August 2nd, and unfortunately there were a lot of trauma cases and my uh, operation was uh, pushed to a uh, later time. So the surgery didn't start until three o'clock, it was a three hour surgery, and uh, it finished at around 6 p.m. I was uh, transferred to the regular floor and everything seemed fine, but at, at one o'clock in the morning, I woke up with some pain, uh, called the nurse, and I was given some morphine, but the pain wasn't going away, so at 2 o'clock, around 2 o'clock an hour later, I, um, I asked to, to see the nurse and actually requested to see uh, the intern or the resident, but it turned out that it was a very busy night, so uh, the intern was uh, scrubbed in the operating room, uh, so I said maybe I could see the resident or the chief resident but they were all in the operating room. So the pain wasn't going away, uh, it was getting worse. Um, they kept instructing the nurse just to give me morphine. And at about 6 a.m., uh, the pain was unbearable and I was actually at the point of uh, leaving against medical advice. I, I called my boss, who at that time was the uh, CICU director, requesting him to transfer me to another hospital. But he knew the chief medical officer of the hospital I was admitted to, and uh, the chief medical officer contacted my orthopedic surgeon right away, and in like 15 minutes, uh, he was there. So by the time he got there, I was, um, the, the pain was excruciating, and I was rushed to the operating room. Um, I have lost my lateral compartment, so uh, all the muscles were dead, and there was so much swelling so that they couldn't close my, my leg. And instead of one surgery, I ended up, ended up having six surgeries. I actually developed a pseudomonas osteomyelitis or infection of the bone. And uh, it became a long process instead of the promise, uh, this is gonna be a quick and simple surgery. Um, but I still considered myself lucky that I didn't lose my leg. If I didn't have any connections, then I'm probably one of those who would have uh, gotten his uh, leg amputated. But um, it, it made me really uh, appreciate being a patient. After the incident, I spoke to the nurse, I spoke to the residents, and, and everyone obviously was uh, apologetic, and, and it's not like they were lazy or incompetent. I'm, I'm gonna start off with, Every system is to uh, produce that many of the organizations that crafted that definition. Their improvement. Okay, I'm having problems with my uh, slide. I can't move. Okay, so the IHI used six adjectives to describe what quality in healthcare is supposed to be. The very first adjective is safe. Uh, effective is the second one, and uh, we will be focusing on that particular adjective later on. 
The third one is patient-centered. Uh, healthcare is also supposed to be timely, efficient, and equitable. In layman's terms, that means that there should be no needless deaths, no needless pain or suffering, no unwanted waits, no helplessness, and no waste. Some of you may have seen this graph uh, in the past, uh, and it, sh it, this, it shows how healthcare um, relates to other types of industries when it comes to safety. So on the right-hand side of the graph, you would see industries that are uh, considered to be ultra-safe. So less than one complication for every 100,000 um, opportunities for error. And you could see this um, airline industry is there, particularly referring to airline, airlines in uh, Western countries. Uh, European railroads uh, is also there, as well as nuclear, nuclear power plant industry. On the left-hand side are industries that are considered dangerous, where you see more than one error for, for every 1,000 opportunities for error. And together with mountain climbing, you would see healthcare. Okay, I keep losing the control of my... So the experts in quality are saying that if the airline industry tolerated the error rate that healthcare industry does, there would be about three jumbo jet crashes every two days. These are the number of people who die from preventable errors in healthcare. Healthcare is unsafe. Uh, the first reason is that there tends to be a lack of awareness. And most of the time, rather than assuming uh, that we are humans and we will commit errors. Okay, so as I have stated earlier in, my, uh, in the anecdote that I had shared, medical errors are committed by competent caring people doing what other competent caring people would do. And to quote, quality problems occur not because of a failure of goodwill, knowledge, effort, or resources devoted to healthcare, but because of fundamental shortcomings in the way care is organized. There's a, there was a lot of pushback at the beginning of the quality improvement movement, at least here in the United States. They kept saying that healthcare is so much more complicated. Um, for example, anesthesia, which is considered the, the safest of all the different specialties, there is about one death for every 200,000 cases, and that's so much less now compared to what anesthesia used to be in the 1960s and in the 1970s. But even one death per 200,000 cases is still 25 times more dangerous than flying. Uh, but the people who push back against quality improvement uh, would keep saying that healthcare is so much more common, 155,000 plus. But I would argue, uh, and yet they are the, the analytical consideration of how to achieve the best results to get the job done. Uh, and we, we keep every day but we make little headway in making things better. What are the barriers to quality? There are poor physical quality. But I would argue that quality is even more relevant in resource consumers, resource allocation and use. And resource improvement, a uh, resource without improvement will only buy the same failed processes. And this is a very expensive uh, process. Uh,
wealthy in low and middle income countries. There are very few studies, unfortunately. The first study actually came out just three years ago. This was in the British Medical Journal looking at safety, so not even quality, just patient safety. And what they did was to review uh, medical records from uh, eight countries. And these are the most common uh, reasons that they found as the sources of uh, complications. Uh, therapeutic error, mistakes in diagnosis, operative errors, so the same thing that we see here in the Western world where they operate on the wrong leg or the wrong side of the brain. Uh, a lot of obstetric uh, um, preventable errors as well as neonatal uh, errors. When they ask the experts, what do you think are the uh, ways to reduce these errors? People always assume that improving the resources would be key in reducing uh, complications uh, in, in, in the healthcare setting, but the, when, when the experts compiled what they think are the uh, remedy for these uh, problems, resources is there, but it's not up there. It's, it was the fifth uh, in terms of the ways to curtail some of these problems. The top three recommendation is one, having protocol and treatment guidelines and really better oversight of the processes and better outcomes tracking. Uh, continuing education was uh, touted as pro possibly the second uh, best uh, uh, remedy for, for the problems that they were seeing and improving communication across specialties and across the different personnel. Uh, this is another study that was published in the Bulletin of the World Health Organization and this pertains to the use and prescription of, of medication. So again, we assume that if we only uh, increase the, uh, the availability of medications, then we will improve the health outcomes in low and middle income countries. But this report was an eye-opener. Uh, it, it summarized the results of studies that were reported between 1990 and 2006. And what they found was that there's generally poor quality prescribing and poor quality of data for both public and private sector. So it's, it wasn't limited to the public sector. More than 50% of all medications are prescribed, dispensed, or sold inappropriately, and half of all patients fail to take the medications correctly, and that less than 30 to 40% are treated according to existing clinical guidelines. So I'm, I'm going to go back to the Western world, and uh, these are four of the organizations that measure quality uh, here in the United States. We have the Consumer Report, Health Grades, the LeapFrog Group, and the U.S. News uh, and Health. And there was a study that was published in March of this year where they looked at the ratings of those four organizations. And this uh, paper was authored by some of the biggest names in, in quality improvement, including Peter Pronovost, Ashish Cha. And what they found was that these four national rating systems uh, frequently come to very different conclusions about which hospitals are best or worse. Some hospitals were rated in the top 10 percentile and they found themselves in the lower 10 percentile in, by the, uh, in the other uh, ratings of the, of the other organizations. And it really highlighted that we still don't have a very good grasp, grasp of what quality in healthcare is supposed to be. So the last part of the talk, I will focus on uh, some of the elements of quality, which I think we could all agree as uh, important in, in, uh, in healthcare. The first one is application of evidence-based interventions to individual patients every single time. The problem, of course, is that um, ev evidence-based medicine does not exist for everything that we do in healthcare. So the, the gold standard for evidence-based medicine is prospective randomized controlled trial. But there are a lot of flaws with the use of prospective randomized controlled trial to direct clinical practice. One, they provide an average effect. Uh, it is a population-based study. We also typically evaluate one intervention at a time in, in, in a prospective randomized controlled trial. Uh, seldom do we try to uh, uh, evaluate combinations of interventions. Uh, an important uh, issue which arises in the intensive care unit where I work is that 
uh, there are lots of inclusion and exclusion criteria that would limit the external validity. For example, for ICU studies, we typically would exclude patients older than 75 years old. At least here in the United States, a significant fraction of our patients are greater than 75 years, years old. So what are we supposed to do when we're taking care of these patients? Uh, a more important reason uh, uh, or flaw of, of evidence-based medicine as it exists now uh, is that there are lots of errors and biases that abound in, in the medical literature. Uh, a landmark study that came from John Unidas where he looked at the most cited original clinical research uh, of the uh, previous century found that a third of them were later refuted. So th this is a paper that was published a couple of years ago, and this is looking at one journal, so the New England Medical uh, Journal of Medicine, and it, it's, it's, it's one of the highest impact journal. And what the author, authors did was just to review over a decade some of the standards of practice that were evaluated. And what they found is that out of 363 articles that tested the standard of care, there were more articles that actually concluded that the standard of care turned out to be not the best possible option in terms of providing the best outcome and later turned into reversal of that practice. In an accompanying editorial of that paper, uh, John Unidas wrote, uh, uh, and he entitled this his editorial as, how many contemporary medical practices are worse than doing nothing or doing less? And I quote in his editorial, he said, half of what we know might be wrong and the other half useless. Uh, these are some of the, of the other problems with, with evidence-based medicine. Uh, an analysis of more than a thousand Cochrane systematic reviews found that in almost half of them, after looking at all the evidence uh, to evaluate a certain intervention, they concluded that the current evidence does not support either benefit or harm and their recommendation in 96% of their systematic reviews is that additional research is recommended before we could really say whether an intervention is beneficial or harmful. And on top of that, most of what we do as clinicians um, has never been formally put to the test. So measuring effective care is limited to few diagnoses and are narrow in scope. Uh, for example, here in the United States, we measure how effective our care is for acute coronary syndrome by measuring the, uh, the time from, uh, from door to balloon, or we measure how effective our care is for septic patients by looking at the time to antibiotics as well as the uh, time to, uh, as, as well as early fluid resuscitation. But that's a minute fraction of the interventions that we do. The rest of the interventions are not really uh, appraised in terms of how effective they are. The second element of quality is really the service part. This is what the patient sees. And this refers to compassion, good patient provider communication, and shared decision making. Uh, in, in the US, um, we, we use patient satisfaction surveys to, uh, to evaluate the, the, the service component of quality. Uh, but it turned out that this is not as straightforward as we think. Uh, there was a landmark paper that came out of the University of California Davis uh, investigators where they found that the most satisfied patients were also more likely to use more prescription drugs, get more hospitalized, hospitalized even after adjustment for their severity of illness, and are more likely to die. So the take-home message of the paper is that the patient's perception of quality is colored by whether or not their expectations were met. And finally, what I think and what most experts think, think as the, the most important element of quality is this teamwork and culture of quality. Uh, this is a bit invisible to the patient. They don't really see or appreciate or understand the amount of teamwork that needs to happen uh, in the ICU, in the emergency room, in the operating room. There is really no appreciation of what a culture of quality is, and that pertains to every personnel in the healthcare organization, whether they're providers or not providers, uh, and whether they feel empowered 
uh, to contribute to making sure that they're constantly improving the way they deliver care. And at present, there is really no tool to measure teamwork and the culture of quality that is that could be routinely uh, used to, to measure that component of quality. So the holy grail really, what we are trying to uh, design here, uh, at, at least in our laboratory, is a digital quality system where we could track all the components of quality continuously and in real time versus what we do now where we create episodic uh, retrospective reports. Uh, which are a bit too late because most of the time the poor quality has already uh, happened and there's nothing that you could do about that. And what we, you, you would like for this system to do is to provide actionable items at the point of care. So I'm going to end my talk there. Uh, I just wanted to, have, uh, to, uh, to acknowledge some of the people that helped me with the work that I do. Uh, the MIT Lab of Computational Physiology, some of the professors that I work with. I work with a lot of uh, core six students from MIT and uh, uh, Institute of Biomedical Engineering students from, from Oxford, as well as residence fellows, nurses, and pharmacies at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And over to you, Yela. Use Otago in a sentence. Thanks, Leo. That was very interesting for me, and I hope for the rest of the people online and um, logged on to our webinar. As of 12.14, we had 38 people live streaming, about um, 20 in uh, the U.S. and in other countries like Germany, Korea, Ireland, and an unknown country. Uh, we'd like to thank you again for that very interesting lecture, and we'd like to thank our sponsor for today's webinar, the National Kidney and Transplant Institute, Asia's leading kidney and transplant center. Before we proceed to our Q&A portion, and we already have one long question from Tony de Marcaida, which we, I will read first. Let's listen to one of our panelists give his reaction. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Teodoro or Ted Herbosa, UPCM class of 1983. He's a general surgeon specializing in medical education, disaster medicine, and emergency medical care. And he was former undersecretary of the Department of Health, and he is very much into e-health. Ted, a five-minute reaction. Hi, Yella, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Also to Leo for that wonderful insight on measuring quality in healthcare. That's really a very difficult to topic. Probably I'm the most senior in this particular webinar, uh, as you can uh, glean from the year I graduated, 1983. The computer at that time was still monochrome, and we were still playing the different games, uh, com completely different from today. But the healthcare has changed. The whole system, the way to approach uh, healthcare today is really more a systems approach and a team approach. Uh, I've worked a lot in a very chaotic environment. My field is trauma, emergency, and disasters. And to be able to standardize quality, even safety for that matter, we developed the chaos, uh, to organize the chaos into systems. So the way to look at it is, I, I agree with Leo in his latter part of his talk. Well, it's about networks and it's about teams the healthcare system really works on this level, wherein there are teams that work in the pre-hospital setting, in the uh, acute care setting, in the ICU setting, in the operating theater, or even in outpatient chronic care. So the way we should measure quality should look at two things, especially for low middle income countries like ours. Uh, part of the Department of Health before, we've looked at two things, efficiency of the health system and affordability together with the quality. And the quality can be measured as well as uh, really the, the stakeholder satisfaction. Leo mentioned about how patients feel about that system delivering to them. There's actually the other component wherein how doctors feel about that. Those of you who trained at the Philippine General Hospital hear the complaints of our doctors because the infrastructure just there or the systems aren't in place to provide the quality that you want to measure. So you need to go through those levels of where the system works and you have to look at 
turn certain control knobs so that the teamwork, the interplay of all the uh, whole continuum of care will do happen. And uh, yes, I agree, measuring health is very difficult. It's, there are still no quantifiable acceptable measures. We did work for patient safety as well. If you remember the safe surgical checklist was actually studied in the Philippines. I led that particular uh, portion of that global study on changing outcomes surgery through a safe surgery checklist develop, we developed at WHO. So the idea really is now that uh, you understand the whole system. The system in the U.S. is different, very litigious. In fact, quality can be equated to lack of uh, risk management uh, there. Whereas here, looked at about being able to access that particular care or modern uh, uh, technology where the people can use it. And I, I believe what he's doing at Harvard together at uh, Beth Deaconess, together with looking at the uh, digital networks and how to be able to study is the way to go. We're now looking at big data analytics. And I think that's the way we will be able to analyze safety and quality in the future. Thank you. Yes, Yala. Thank you, Dad. That was very quick. And um, you are not afraid to date yourself. But um, I can <laughs> see where you're coming from. <laughs> <laughs> I see where you're coming from working in trauma and also uh, in the ER setting yes. and particularly in uh, disaster situations. I'd like to um, read the first question from Tony de Marcaida for Leo. Uh, it's a bit long, but it is about the graph that you showed early in your lecture comparing how hazardous healthcare is compared to other industries. Um, the question reads, um, the introductory graph showing how hazardous healthcare is shows number of lives lost. I muted myself. Shows the number of lives lost on the y axis and total encounters per time on the x axis. Does the graph actually reflect deaths from errors made, as you explained? or the number of deaths in the specified industry relative to the number of encounters. Because if it's the latter, the implication of the graph may not be that an industry is hazardous, but may simply reflect the critically ill nature of the population that the industry is serving. Did you get that, Leo? I did. So the, the, the answer okay. is... Uh, the answer is the former. So the, the graph represents the number of preventable deaths for every mm -hmm. uh, opportunity for uh, an error. So it's not the total number of deaths. These are the number of preventable deaths. Thank you. Any other questions from the live stream or from those logged in? I have a question, Leo. I'm curious about um, the last um, item you mentioned, which is about the way of the future, which is a digital quality system. Um, what headway has been made in in your experience and um, how promising are the outcomes or the results of that kind of system? So as I mentioned during the talk, there are some uh, diagnoses or medical conditions where we are a bit more advanced in terms of what we know works and we are closely monitoring this particular condition. So uh, every hospital is graded in terms of how they respond to patients who are having a heart attack. Uh, the United Foundation is part of that team to continue the emergency process of sharing support groups and individuals who seek excellence, creativity, and 
the I feel like I'm in North Korea. I'm <laughs> someone else is advertising something while I'm saying something, <laughs> which they're probably censoring. No, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so there are a few conditions where they are tracking our the process itself and they're tracking the the outcomes but it, it turns out that some of some of what we know are still changing <laughs> over time so a, a good example is sepsis uh, the the most cited study ever now is the river study that was performed in the emergency room where they had followed a protocol in terms of how to care for patients who are presenting with sepsis and then 10 years after that protocol has been embraced, uh, we have three new studies that now are saying that the protocol that was used in the river study uh, did not produce any mortality benefit. When they re-evaluated the, the protocol in much larger uh, studies. And, and that really is the trick that really is the biggest challenge with the quality because quality depends on evidence-based medicine and evidence-based medicine is not yet at a point where it's perfect so we we see all these pendulum swings in terms of what we think is the best care for patients one decade we think that steroids are uh, beneficial for patients with sepsis the following decade we we, uh, we, we get told that steroids don't impact the outcome. Um, and, and, and so if we can't really agree what works well, it's gonna be difficult to measure quality. And, and, and the, the flaw that I had explained, is that the fundamental flaw is the fact that clinical guidelines are based on population studies. We are measuring average effect and but in reality there's no average patient and it's it, it it really depends on the doctor of how he or she interprets what the uh what the study is supposed to be saying and w when you lead you when you leave that to the discretion of the doctor you introduce a lot of variation in the way you interpret the literature and that variation as we know is not good when, in, when it comes to quality. So I, I think the, the, the luck, lack of understanding of what really works the best for every patient subset in a very specific clinical context is a big challenge to measuring quality. Uh, everything is being uh, based on what we say as the art of medicine when we know that there's no such thing as really, I mean, there is some so, something about art of medicine, but uh, th there are things that you need to standardize. So w one of the biggest problems is that uh, if you have a patient present to 10 different doctors, you get 10 different uh, suggestions in terms of how to manage that, uh, that particular patient. And we know that that's not good quality uh, because you have one patient being managed very differently we know that there's only probably one best way to manage that patient. So, I mean, that's a long-winded explanation of what the challenges are to digitalizing the measurement of quality real time. Um, but we're, we're hoping that we're moving towards a, a, uh, a, a, a better solution with the advent of precision medicine, which is just a rebranding of personalized medicine. But, it's, it's, a, it's such a buzzword now, but it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. Like um, we're, we're nowhere close to precision medicine. We, we need uh, that the, the I can't hear you, Yella. Sorry, now I am unmuted. I was going to remind you to share your webcam, but very good, you did it on your own. Um, thank you for your answer. Um, it's, I understand the limitations of applying uh, as, uh, you know, just one uh, standard for managing cases and we, we realize the limitations of evidence and that's where we see the other elements of quality like communication, 
uh, a patient pri uh, provider communication comes in and how difficult it is to measure that uh, dimension of quality and all the more the measurement of teamwork and that so-called culture of quality. But I picked up a buzzword from you today, which is precision medicine, and that, uh, and that looks very interesting and promising as well. I'm going to read a question from NKTI from Dr. Ricky Quintos. You may know him. Can I read the question? <laughs> I can't find it. Uh, his question is, uh, you mentioned that anesthesia is considered safest among the specialties. Would you have a rundown ranking of which specialties are safest to the most unsafe? Ooh. Noting that he is a surgeon. <laughs> uh, I, I think the unsafest are the ones that require the most teamwork. Because a lot of the errors turn out to be secondary to uh, poor communication and poor teamwork. So up there would be the ICU where I work at, uh, emergency room mm -hmm. and the operating room. Um, I think those are the areas where teamwork is most crucial. And it, it, it's funny because doctors always feel like there is a strong teamwork in their teams. Like when you, when you uh, yeah. have surveys, the doctors always say, oh, we have good teamwork. We all get along. The nurses don't feel threatened when, uh, when, they, when they feel like they should report something. And then you interview the nurses and you don't get the same response from the nurses. They still feel threatened. They still feel that they don't, they're not empowered to say something when they feel that there is some threat to, to safety. But um, the, there, there's no, I, I don't think that they've actually performed the comparison of the different specialties, but my, I think my guess would be the areas where you need the, the people to be uh, really working well together are the areas where there are so much opportunities for errors. And OBGYN is the other area too, where uh, it could be uh, catastrophic if you don't have good teamwork of the different teams involved. Thank you, Leo. Ricky, I hope that answers your question. Um, so it's more of setting rather than specialty. Although you did mention um, anesthesia as a specialty, I don't know. I don't know why I cannot. I, there is another question online, Leo. This is from uh, Catherine Gatdula. Um, what? No, no, it's not a question. Actually, she's requesting to view the video again, the video of your lecture, Leo. And I, the answer to that is yes, no? We are recording this webinar and uh, it will be available for viewing um, after this session. Okay, uh, Ronald Ferrer is, uh, that's for her. Um, Steph C Stephanie Season, I may know her, Steph. Are there ways, has a question, are there ways to measure the effect of specific interventions on quality, such as 12 hour shifts instead of 24 hours, or the changing of team members? So, quality improvement research is a very challenging area. Doing the before after historical controls, those are uh, laden with potential confounding uh, most of the time. It's, it's, it's very difficult to, um, to really evaluate objectively and the impact of an intervention, um, especially since most of the time there is some education that happens around a certain intervention and you can't really uh, differentiate whether the improvement in outcomes uh, resulted from the intervention itself or maybe it's because of the education that happened or maybe because the people are aware that their performance is being measured that suddenly their teamwork improves during the study period. Um, but th these are all the challenges of, uh, of, of the domain of 
of, of measuring quality improvement. And the other question, Yela, can you, uh, the, the second part, I forgot what the other question is. She only had one question, but there is another one now from Ruby Kaikobel. Do you think that the use of electronic medical records has improved the quality of care or improved tracking the quality of medical care? So yes, uh, but not the entire electronic health records. I, I also think that it might be contributing to some, un, uh, what do you call this, un, un, uh, something that we, we did unpredictable uh, consequences. I, I think the part of the electronic health records that significantly improve uh, outcomes, at least in, in the developed world, is uh, computerized provider order entry. And that is something that everyone should really push for uh, across countries. And you can't say that there's limited resources for and we cannot afford a provider order entry because I think if, if you look at the different components of, of electronic health records, POE has contributed the most in terms of uh, avoiding uh, errors from wrong dose or wrong medication or drug-drug uh, drug interaction. So the, the, the short answer is yes. I, I really think that electronic health records have reduced the number of, uh, of complications from, uh, yeah. from medications. So your answer is it has improved the quality of care. Yes, it has improved. Aside from, aside from all right. Thank you. So yes, yeah, I have to use Otago in a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's another question. I am ignoring what you said. The question is the effort to practice evidence-based medicine and following recommendations from guidelines that are put out by the various medical associations are frequently limited by the quality of the clinical trials available, which you mentioned in your talk. Unless the quality of clinical research improves, will the guidelines ever be truly clinically meaningful? And what can we do in the meantime to improve our own personal capability to provide quality care? So I could spend hours uh, answering that question. So my, my research entails secondary analysis of electronic health records. Uh, I consider electronic health records as lab notebooks because every day we experiment. Every day we don't know the best answer for the patient you're mm -hmm. caring for. We don't really know the optimal amount of fluids to give in the ICU. We don't really know whether drug A versus drug B versus drug C is the best for this specific patient. So every day we experiment, but we don't try to get lessons learned from those experiments. Uh, most of the time, we, we actually don't know what happened to the patient 30 days from now or whether this treatment that we, we, uh, we provided is really the, the best one for that patient. So I'm a, a big advocate of what we term as secondary analysis of electronic health records. And I think this is very important in low and middle income countries. So the clinical guidelines in, in low and middle income countries are currently based on studies that were performed in the developed world. And yeah. I don't think that we could believe that what's best for the Europeans and the United States are also gonna be the best for the Filipinos or some other country. And we need to get people in low and middle income countries really enthusiastic about creating their own evidence, doing their own research, finding out what works best for the populations that they serve. And to me, the value of converting into electronic health records is not just to facilitate better care, but the really the, the, the bigger value is the digital data that you collect. And you could perform mm -hmm. analytics so could, you could figure out whether 
among Filipinos in a certain province whether drug A is better than drug B by looking at what happened to those who got those particular drugs. Again, easier said than done. Observational studies are typically um, challenged by what we term as residual confounding that there could be other reasons apart from the interventions that led to the outcomes and not really the interventions itself. So the type of analytics is it's not easy. And that's what we are trying to do at the same time as we advocate for electronic health records, we're also um, trying to get more people involved with data analytics. So uh, a, a shameless plug, we're, we're gonna start a, a course on secondary analysis of electronic health records at MIT, it's going to be streamed um, globally without cost. Uh, and the, the reason for this is we want to get more people involved with knowledge generation, with, uh, with uh, evidence creation. And we want that to be based on your actual experience as documented in your own electronic health records. All right. Thank you, Leo. So it looks like electronic medical records is one, is the right direction, is the <clears throat> maybe baby steps, but the, in the right direction. And uh, certainly not the shameless plug, Leo. We'll be interested to know how to sign up, when the course will start, etc., especially since you mentioned that it is at no cost. Um, it's 12.57 in Manila, and so uh, we have time for one last Oh, the last two questions. Uh, first is that quality is very difficult to quantify. Is patient safety and patient survival the only main objective parameters for um, quantifying or measuring quality? So there are lots of discussion of whether mortality or survival whether that is a good measure of quality. And there are more and more uh, proponents of saying that, that that should not be the, uh, the metric for, for measuring quality. Uh, but right now, mortality is the easiest to measure. Um, there's really only mm -hmm. two possible answers there, whether they're alive or dead. That's why it's become a very easy target for measuring quality in terms of health outcomes but again everyone is going to be interested more in the quality of life um, and and other uh, metrics apart from from patient survival or death uh, patient safety is a bit easier so that really pertains to not operating on the wrong leg not operating on the wrong side of the brain that's the reason why we do the timeout. That's the reason behind the surgical uh, checklist. Uh, I, I think patient safety is a little bit easier to measure, but patient safety does not mean quality. Not ju just because you're safe doesn't mean that we've achieved the best outcome for you. To me, patient safety is the first step. Uh, it's, it's the minimum requirement. First, do no harm. We should, we should not be harming you. Um, but that's really far away from what we would like, which is the best possible outcome given the condition that you have. Thank you, Leo. And the last question um, is, in a third world country like the Philippines, how can we improve the quality of care in the absence of electronic medical records? So I think the first step, and th this is based on experience. So my other research project involves um, global health informatics, which is designing information systems for digital capture of health data in uh, low and middle income countries. And we go in there and we try to uh, introduce all this technology, the use of mobile health applications, and then most of the time there will be a successful pilot study, but when it comes to scale up, we almost always fail. And we realize that our problem is that there is mm -hmm. no culture of quality improvement. Uh, people don't really appreciate or understand what we're trying to do. There's the novelty of the technology, but there is still no um, accountability. They, 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 there's still no interest in 
in continual learning and in continuous um, attempts to improve the way you deliver care. They don't want to be measured. They always think that electronic health records or measurement of quality is a way for us to see how poorly they're performing. So there's no interest in constantly trying to, to improve your game is the first step. Not it has to be that culture of patient safety and quality improvement. Everyone has to feel that they are accountable, that to be constantly contributing to, uh, to, to looking at the system as a whole and improving the effectiveness and the efficiency of that system. So we have to do that before we could even think of electronic health records. So a system of accountability, a system and a culture of accountability for each patient outreach, patient encounter. Yes. Okay. That was the last question. Thank you very much, Leo. That was a very stimulating lecture and a very interesting um, discussion and thank you to all our um, participants in this webinar who are either logged in or are viewing this lecture from the live stream. As of um, 1246, we had 49 people viewing our webinar. Um, through us the definition of um, quality of care and there is no agreed upon uh, definition. Um, I learned many things like uh, that um, errors um, in healthcare are more common than thought and um, a lot of it is attributed to the organization and design of the healthcare system uh, and in particular particular very top-down uh, hierarchical system does not um, quality improvement is possible in all settings and even in a low income or low resource countries or settings it's actually not an excuse not uh, not to pursue quality improvement but actually an impetus to um, pursue quality share with us um, some landmark studies on um, defining quality measuring quality and and safety and um, lastly he uh, shared with us the elements of quality of care which uh, can be grouped into three main elements which are um, the application of evidence-based medicine in um, decisions making in clinical decision making but this has its limitations um, communication, patient provider, um, communication and compassion and um, shared decision making between uh, patient and provider and the last dimension being teamwork and a culture of quality. Thank you very much, Leo. After this session, a survey will be launched on your computers and or sent to your emails. Please answer the survey so we can assess our webinar and address more of your preferences and give you materials from this session. After answering the survey, you will be sent your CME certificates. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again in our next webinar on diabetes management on August 5, Wednesday, Again, 12 noon to 1 p.m. Manila time. Our speaker in August will be Dr. Iris Isip Tan, endocrinologist, medical informatics guru, and medical blogger with the handle Endocrine Witch to give a webinar on diabetes management. Please invite all your colleagues to join this continuing monthly CME webinar series. All webinar schedules and resources will be posted at upm.edu.ph slash upmedwebinars. 
Special thanks to our sponsor, National Kidney and Transplant Institute. And on behalf of UPCM Class 1990 and the UP Medical Alumni Society, we also thank our collaborator units, UP Manila Information Management Service, the National Telehealth Center, UP College of Medicine, Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, and Medical Informatics Unit, and Ms. Charisse Orhalo, our webinar host. This is Yela Castillo together with Leo Selly and the UP Med webinar team closing this session. We hope you have learned a lot from today's webinar and have a great week ahead. Thank you. Oh my gosh, good luck.